Hey guys, Natural Progressive. I am back and one day I have two great, great interviews. I'm very excited to have John Halstead here with me today. Um, he is a writer and an environmentalist and he has done articles for the Huffington Post, Pothos, Gods and Radicals. He did an article um, called What If It Is Too Late? And we're going to open up with that and we'll see where it takes us from there. But first, I just want to make sure y'all know, um, you know, the, the system by now, hopefully. Uh, but if you're new, like the last 15 minutes, so a quarter to where we will be opening it up for questions and comments for my favorite people here. Um, but for now, John Halstead, would you please say hello? Hi. Uh, it's a pleasure <laughs> to be here. Thanks for having me. Thank you. I, I'm very happy to have you here with me. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm so excited to talk to you for so many reasons. After watching your interview with Sam Mitchell, I, I loved all the things you talked about. And, and I want to dive further into a couple of those things. But first, will you just kind of talk about your article you wrote what if it is too late sure uh so uh, i guess where i can start is i've been uh involved in environmental activism for uh several years i'm kind of a late comer to to activism and um uh, early on in my my process i participated in an event at uh called Break Free. It was part of the 350.org's um, uh, anti-fossil fuel uh, movement. And um, I was going to be part of the group that was going to get arrested that day at, 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 a, at a tar sands refinery in Whiting, Indiana. And I heard Bill McKibben speak, who's the founder of 350, is probably one of the more well-known uh, people, to, you know, more well-known environmental activists. And um, I remember uh, hearing him speak, and towards the end of his talk, he said um, that we're not going to win the fight against climate change, that it's already too late for that, and uh, we still need to fight, but um, basically we've lost. And I remember, <laughs> I'm still pretty new to this thing, and I remember that like hitting me upside the head, and I'm like, what did he just say? Did, did I hear him right? And I was a little too caught up in, you know, in literally in like 10 minutes, I was going to go get arrested. So I was like, I cannot deal with this right now. I've got to go and uh, get, get arrested. So, um, and that kind of, I put, kind of put it in the back burner of my head for a few years while I helped organize a chapter of 350 in here in Indiana and um, got involved in various forms of activism. Right. And then, and then a little bit, you know, later on, it came back to me, um, uh, various things I've been reading um, started m making me wonder: is it is it too late for the you know for the for the for climate change to be really stopped? And that that speech came back to me, and I was like, did I hear him right? And I and I went and I found it online and I listened to it again. And I was like, sure enough, that's exactly what he said years ago. Um, and it's just now like hitting me. Yeah, it's too late. Yeah, I'm, I'm new to that as well. I even newer than you as far as it being too late. Um, I, my whole entire life, I've kind of realized that we were heading into a problem with, with population and, and destroying our environment that we depend on. So I, I, I've always had that feeling that, that doom was coming, but you know, it, it, it seems so far out in the future and now it doesn't seem like it's so far out in the future. And it does seem like it's too late from all the research I've been doing. Um, so I totally relate to that. And when I found out it was, it, it's kind of a shocker, um, but not, I mean, I accepted it probably a lot quicker than, than most people will, but anyway, <laughs> it's not about me. So I tell me what you think about this. It, in my opinion, the best thing we can do right now is, is try to hold on to as for as long as we can, the natural world, what is left. 
and instead of building new things, which will take not, you know, resources from the ground, raw materials is 80% of, of the pollution that that's entered into the environment or not the pollution, sorry, it's 80% of the reason for biodiversity loss, which is a huge problem, um, not only for us, but for all the other beings on this planet. And that is, uh, that's, it's just horrifying to me that that we're at this point where we keep increasing in population. Um, what do you think about that? I mean, what would you do in this scenario? What would you recommend other people do? Um, well, I, I wrote this piece after, uh, not after, but kind of in the middle of going through a, a de period of depression. And I don't suffer from depression usually, but I coming to this realization kind of set me into a, a depressive phase. And, and then looking back, uh, I realized that I had kind of been going through the stages of grief with my activism uh, mm -hmm. for a long time. And that in a way, even my, um, even all the marching and protesting was in a way, it was a, it was a form of denial. Like I wasn't denying that climate change was real, but I was denying the severity of the problem. I was denying that, um, you know, that this, I, I was thinking this could be fixed with, if we could just switch to wind and solar, right? That would, that mm -hmm. seems easy. And, um, and I was not really appreciating the, the, how fundamental, uh, the problem is with our society. And, um, and then I kind of went through, uh, you know, the, <laughs> The anger phase where you know i'm like well just you know you know if we could just kill all the politicians that we have right now and start from <laughs> scratch and then eat the rich burn right, them up <laughs> right eat the rich um and then and then i moved into the depressive phase and now i think i feel like i'm moving into the acceptance phase and um you know i my i would encourage people to um kind of sit not do anything in it initially like sit with the idea that um, first of all, that we as individuals are going to die. I mean, I, d dealing with our own personal mortality is, is a hard enough thing. That's the easiest part for me. Oh, really? Well, yeah. then for, for me, like, because I was raised uh, in a Christian religion. I know, Mormon, we we're going to talk about oh, that. Okay. <laughs> but um, so, you know, coming to terms with that was hard. But then I thought, okay, well, it's okay. Um, if I'm going to die and I'm not going to survive into some future life um, because humanity will go on and I'm going to contribute to the story of humanity and humanity will continue progressing and we'll continue this great technological enterprise that we've engaged in. It's just going to grow and grow and grow. And, um, and then it hit me that, well, no, it's not there. There's, there are finite limits to uh, the world and, that this idea, this very idea of wanting to live forever, either individually or through our creations, right? We're through, mm -hmm. in a way, that's what civilization is, is this attempt to live forever through what we create. And I that, see that differently, but <laughs> yeah, go ahead. That, you know, giving up on that, I, I it was like, I had to go through another like dark period because uh, it was like realizing uh, my mortality all over again, but on a more on a on a species level, you mm -hmm. know. And um, I think the failure to deal with the reality of death uh, is really at the heart of our our sick relationship with our with our world. And um, so I would encourage people first just start with deal with that. Yeah. Well, if you're, if you're deeply religious and you believe you're, you're going to heaven after, or, or you're going to become a God of your own planet later. Um, that's not every religion. That's just one particular religion. Anyway, <laughs> I mean, one? One? I don't know which one. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> anyway. So if you think um, life goes on after like, like almost like normal, it's just, it's going to be even better you know, why take care of the place you love now, if it's going to be better in the next life, you right. know, exactly. where it's not exactly on our planet. If you're, if you're worshiping a, 
superior being instead of worshiping the actual um, entity that gave you life, which is the planet, which planet. is nature, right. that, that totally changes everything about how you treat um, the environment around you. You know what I mean? Right. You, you turn into a conqueror, like making everything better for you. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Well, there's um, my transition from Mormonism to <coughs> paganism um, kind of goes along the lines of what you were talking about. It's giving up the the idea that my life was really going to begin after I died. You know, that this was just some sort of temporary Period that I had to suffer through, and then when it was over, I got to get to the the real good stuff, and and coming to embrace the the beauty, or trying to at least embrace the beauty and the and the of the natural world and of my connection to it <coughs> was really right. at the heart, heart of what paganism was. There's a quote uh, that I come back to a lot from um, Albert Camus. He says. Uh, if there's a sin against life, it consists in hoping for another life and eluding the implac implacable grandeur of this life. And I realized that my, my, the way I was in my religion of origin, now not, not everybody who's Christian and not everybody who's Mormon is going to be like that, right? Some people manage to be religious and be Christian or whatever and, and still honor and respect the natural world. I, I, wasn't i was very much kind of a th otherworldly and um coming to realize how disconnected i was from my body and from the natural world and from reality um is was part of my transition to paganism and away from the religion that i've been raised with see that's amazing okay you should know i live in utah oh okay you should know what i'm talking about <laughs> <laughs> yeah and of course i've had a lot of exposure to that um born and raised here okay. um my parents both were raised mormon my stepdad is an atheist or at least he claimed to be last time we had that discussion which was when i was about 12 i don't know <laughs> um my my mom considers herself a jack mormon my biological father still considers himself kind of a jack mormon as well and and so i kind of have an understanding and plus all you know everybody that i'm around is is or not everybody but a good portion of the people that i interact with are lds and i always like thought they were a little delusional and didn't really think about what's really happening um I have a really good friend who years ago, she would say that all the animals on the planet were put here for, for humans to use. Um, what do they call it? Beasts of burden, you know? And, and that just made me really sad. And we had lots of arguments over that because I, I don't see it that way. I did never have, have a pet. Did that person have, I always wonder about that attitude. Like, did, did she have a pet by chance? Um, at the time she did not. Because people, develop relationships with pets that yeah. are very very similar to human human oh. relationships you know yeah and they I, do but she imagine... could still put down a horse so easy like she has horses yeah, i don't i don't understand that you know um you know you can have this kind of almost human relationship with a dog or a cat and then think that other animals don't have feelings it yeah doesn't doesn't make sense to me she would always tell me i have the i had this horse that was going up into his 30s that i've had since i was eight years old and um i was in my late 30s at the time wait no i was in my yeah late 30s when he was like 18 or something and she's like you just need to put him down he's no good anymore just put him down and i couldn't do it i was like there's no way i could do that this horse has been a part of my life since i was eight years old there's no way I'm just going to put him down. And he lived to be 34 when I finally ended up putting him down. And it was because he couldn't get up anymore. He laid down and he still was fighting to live because the, he, he, he couldn't get up anymore. He was done. And the vet had to give him two shots to, to put him down. He was fighting so hard to still live. And it made me feel like hell. And yeah, it's like, I just don't understand how people just because an animal is you know a little elderly that they can just 
no, it's time to put him down. Yeah, I'm a lawyer in my day life. And one of the frustrating things about I'm here in Indiana and the law here in Indiana, if, if you um, like if you're in an accident, obviously somebody will compensate you for your injuries. But if, if you accidentally kill someone's pet, they're only entitled to the property value of that pet. Right. Right. Not the relational and the pain and suffering of losing a member of your family, which is it's real. Right. Right. Yeah, it is. And, and I remember having lots of discussions. Um, I used to be on this thing. It's, it's, it's called KSL. It's a news station and they would have like comments on news stories and, and it was really popular. People would go on there and just, you know, talk about news stories back and forth. And, and they were going through trying to make a, uh, a, a law against animal abuse. And I would be, of course, like, no, you know, animals don't need to be abused. Why is that a problem? And every time I'd argue against um, or for a law against animal abuse, there'd be people like talking about how, you know, there's there's children that are abused and you're worried about this and, and you can't make laws about that. What about the kids? Like it was. You don't see a connection between the way we treat animals and the way we treat each other. I mean, right, you know, right. <laughs> or the earth, you know, it's exactly. all connected. Exactly. So yeah, and, and that's I guess my whole point, and 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 I I hope I'm I'm thinking because I delved into paganism myself because it does, um, it does focus on nature a lot more than than a, a superior human like being, and and that's important. If we were to worship nature like we worship a god, we'd treat it differently. So we don't and and that's why we're in the mess we are in not realizing that we depend on the nature as much as you know um yeah. as much as anything i mean <laughs> that's that's what gave us life the, right. we can't live without it so i don't understand it and when i die i f- figure i'm going to be cremated and i'll go back into the into the earth and help something else grow and live i at least i hope I hope there's still a planet when that happens. Right, <laughs> right, right. I hope there's still life that can grow from my death. It's, I mean, that's a natural process of it, right? Right. And I do believe the energy lives on, and and that's where I differ from a lot of people who are atheists. I think that the energy, you know, like the the consciousness, I think that that's somehow there. I don't know in what form, but I think it's still there, uh, just from personal experiences that. <laughs> a little deep for this conversation no, that's fine well, I, I think um you know i think i don't think we're going to manage to kill off all life at least there's going to be microbial life that that uh, our bodies can feed and i uh, hope so i hope there's might, something life might reset but i imagine we'll we won't make, we, we're not going to kill absolutely everything well there's people that think that it could yeah so, but uh, i mean if you look at places like chernobyl I mean, yeah. I mean, the wor- the worst you know we could do is like you know, global nuclear war, and mm-hmm. um, you know look at places like Chernobyl and nature's returning. So, um, uh, you know, I that's hopeful. Nature, yeah, nature's very and resilient, and I like uh, Derek Jensen says life wants to live. Yeah, yeah. I just interviewed him. I don't know if you know that, but oh, that's great. <laughs> You're fresh from an interview <laughs> of him. And of course I promoted you coming on right before or right at the end. So There's somebody I really admire. He's uh, he's, he's amazing. We had yeah. a great conversation. I could talk to him for hours and hours and hours, but uh, I had to keep it to an hour. So <laughs> yeah. Um, so what else do you think or how else do you think religion influences how we treat our environment? I mean, as far as, uh, extraction of resources and things like that um just just the way they view the environment over ah shoot compared to a god or like the people are more important and they don't ever put the focus on the environment i mean you know know, when i started uh when i transitioned from christianity to paganism Mm-hmm. I, it was tempting for me to like paint with a broad brush and say that my experience of Mormonism or my experience of Christianity was 
was indicative or, or typical of everyone's experience. And, and to think that also that paganism was, you know, this, uh, you know, going to be this, the salvation of humankind. And um, the reality is, I think it's, it's much more complicated. I, I a few, few years ago, I spent, um, I don't know, maybe two years ago, I went to a um, festival called the uh, Wild Goose in Northern Carol uh, North Carolina. And um, it's a gathering, it's a festival for progressive Christians. Mm -hmm. And it's the most pagan group of Christians I've ever, ever met. Really? Although they probably wouldn't, they probably wouldn't admit uh, like that term. But um, yeah, I was, I was amazed at how um, environmentally conscious they were and social justice concerns. And I was like, geez, I might have never stopped being Christian if this had been my Christian. Right. Uh, and, and there's actually a Baptist preacher that, that is pushing Extinction Rebellion. Oh, so. yeah. And, and there's, I can't remember his name, but there's, a, there's an evangelical who, uh, who's been making a circuit and about his conversion to, um, you know, accepting climate change and, and so forth. Mm -hmm. And on the flip side, you know, I've encountered pagans who are really disconnected. Really? We, we have, we might have rituals where we invoke the earth. Uh, we might talk about uh, mother, uh, an earth goddess, right? But they're more mm -hmm. abstractions than experiences. And so right. we have uh, for, you know, practical reasons, the rituals may be held indoors and um, it's just not really, really connected to the real earth. And, and then in turn, when, when I go to um, environmental activists, you know, gatherings, protests, actions, um, you know, there may be pagans who are present, but they're not present as pagans. You know, there's, there's still this, um, it's a lack there's a of, stigma. There is. Uh, some yeah. of that, you know, I, I, I don't know how much of that is self-reinforcing uh, because um, pagans are still, a lot of pagans are still in the closet. And then, you know, I think to a certain extent, I think when we act like something is shameful, it, it gets reinforced as something that's shameful. Um, so I'm, I'm a big advocate of people coming out about, about their paganism, especially nowadays. We're kind of, oh yeah, we're you know, there's, there's much less persecution of pagans. My, my concern less now, t today is less about active persecution of pagans, although I know that happens still. Uh, but I'm more concerned about pagans not being taken seriously. Like I think the problem with paganism isn't that it's, um, it's under attack. It's that mm -hmm. it's dismissed. And yeah. part of that's because uh, I think of a lack of organizing and the, and the resistance to any kind of structure or institutionalization in paganism that keeps people from, I mean, we can't do much as individuals. This is one thing I learned from, from activism is like as individuals, we're practically powerless. But, mm -hmm. but when we come together in large groups, then we, you know, our voices are amplified. And right. that's... Um, that's part of the reason I, uh, a few years ago, start. I, I got together a group of pagan leaders, and we we drafted a uh, pagan community statement on the environment because I wanted to get, um, uh, you know, I wanted. I, I saw that like Christian, various groups of Christians and Hindus and Muslims, and practically every religion has uh, some kind of statement on the environment, and pagans don't. And uh, so yeah, that's odd because. Of what their religion is based on is right. It's odd. Yeah. And so, and, and it was, it was only because of the lack of organization. And so we, you know, we put it out there for public comment before we published it in the final form. And then we started collecting signatures. And right now it's got almost 10,000 signatures, which from a pagan perspective is really great because there's never been anything that has gotten 10,000 pagan voices just together That's good. on anything. However, I've known a lot of those here in Utah, which is really weird. <laughs> but on the flip side, 10,000 signatures from a community that boasts of having at least a million people in the United States mm -hmm. is really small. So, yeah. um, you know, I, I, I'm proud of the work we did and I'm, I'm glad we got, you know, that it, that it has succeeded to the point that it has. But it also, I think it's indicative of a disengagement of a lot of pagans with um, environmentalism which is surprising and uh, and sad 
yeah and you'll see it like uh pagan rituals the, you know this like using plastic for um uh you know when they when they have refreshments and things like this and um you know that's not the be all and end all of environmentalism is what you know but it's, <coughs> it's a good start good place to start is uh mm -hmm. you know not using yeah. plastic and as cycle rituals yeah no kidding wow okay we're gonna go into a different direction as interesting okay. as the religious one is for me um it, it really is it's it's one of my things but i i want to talk about the flooding in the midwest and the 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 resulting food shortage that is sure to be an issue upcoming as well as you know many other uh horrific weather events that are are bound to 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 keep coming our direction um do you think that's that's going to really affect us in the u.s soon or or do you think there's still a long ways out considering two almost two years of of harvest has been lost in that one event so so you're asking kind of like how quickly are things going to get really bad yeah i know they're starting but yeah. how um <laughs> you know i i think what we're going to see what we have been seeing really gradually since probably the 70s and, and what we're going to continue to see is um you know we're going to have obviously more and more extreme weather which is going to mm -hmm. was going to complicate uh, things for people mostly on the lower end of the economic spectrum, right? Yeah, definitely. And we're going to see a continuation of what has already been going on, which is that that lower end of the economic spectrum is going to be growing. So people have, you know, there's more and more people that have less and less, and there's fewer and fewer people that are accumulating all the wealth, and it's just going to keep continuing. And it's going to happen gradually enough. I think that people are going to have continue to be able to have a plausible deni deniability. They're going to be able to look at other people or at their neighbors and say, "Well, you know, my circumstances are just it's not systemic. It's just uh, there's this phrase. Uh, the reason uh, I can't remember who said it, but this, the reason why socialism has never succeeded in the United States is because everybody is a temporarily embarrassed millionaire." <laughs> and yeah, I've heard we, that. Yeah. So. You know, we uh, middle class Amer middle class Americans uh, like to think that we're all tempor temporarily embarrassed millionaires. That we can all be Bill Gates if just we get you know we're, we're you know one two steps away from that, and, and if we just get our break and uh, and don't see that there's actually structural uh, reasons why that's n not going to happen for ninety nine point nine percent of people. And um, the number of people at the top of the food chain are, is just going to continue to shrink and the bottom is going to continue to grow. And I, I think it's going to be gradual enough that people, you know, we're, we're not going to see like Mad Max, I don't think, in my lifetime. Uh, but um, eventually, I, I, you know, things will, I think, collapse to the point where, uh, you know, the United States, as we, don't, as we know it today, won't exist and um you know things will be very very bad for a lot of people uh they're already starting to get that way for people in third world countries but you know here in the u.s we just we, it's, we've been turning a blind eye to that for yeah but for the people in the in the midwest suffering that issue um and the people in california that have fought the the big wildfires and lost their homes paradise california for one uh, all the hurricane issues. I mean, I think for some people here, it's starting to become reality. And, and I just think it's going to become more and more that way. So you're a little bit more optimistic than I am. I, I'm, I think the food shortage is going to come first and the shortage of clean water supply. I'm very concerned about, especially with the continued and expanding uh, mining for natural resources. I, I don't I wouldn't say that I'm optimistic and the, the reason is I'm I have this kind of perverse faith in capitalism I would love to see it collapse <laughs> I would that. too right but I it has capitalism has this incredible resilience and ability to turn whatever circumstances or whatever challenges are presented to it and turn it around and make turn it into more capitalism and better minds than I uh, have 
worked out why and how that happens. But, you know, I, I feel like even with people who are experiencing, um, I mean, we see this with like, um, in, with, in the Trump era, we have, we have these people who are on, you know, receiving uh, government assistance who talk about welfare queens, you know, like, mm -hmm. like it's, you know, like it's, it's always somebody else and, and th their circumstances, they don't put themselves in that category. Right. And even with the natural disasters, there's this book, um, Don't Even Think About It by George Marshall. And he talks about how our psychologically, we are not almost from an evolutionary perspective. We're, we're not equipped. Uh, our brains are not equipped to deal with something like climate change. And the thing that he, one of the examples he keeps coming back to is like the people on the East Coast who are hit by, um, what was the, help me out, the big hurricane that hit New York and- Ah, uh, there's Sandy. Sandy. Wasn't that the one that was up there? Yes. So Sandy, and then, but they actually found that people, uh, belief in or, or concern about climate change actually declined among people who were suffering the effects of um, Sandy. And really? um, <laughs> maybe it's because, you know, when, you, uh, when you're fighting for survival, your concerns become very local and immediate. And climate change, unfortunately, has been framed as this Global, global. Issue, right it's a very big thing and it's mm -hmm. something that people who like me who are very very privileged and comfortable have the luxury to you know have a sit down and have a podcast about and i'm not fighting i'm not fighting the effects of it and um and i see that in a lot of my a lot of activism it's really the people Unfortunately, it's the people who, um, who are very privileged who have the time and resources to go, go out in the streets and take a day off of work and, and, you know, and protest. And people who are being most directly affected, they can't do that. They can't no, they're too busy work. working three yeah, jobs, right. <laughs> just trying to survive. And um, so, you know, I'm, I'm not sure that even the spread of um, environmental disasters or you know, inclement weather and, and extreme weather events will necessarily even um, push us in that in that direction. Uh, I mean, for some people, obviously it will, but. Oh, I'd think about it. I'm thinking about it as we speak. I mean, this is the weather that I see and it is a global issue, but it starts locally. Like there's certain areas that are going to be locally worse than others. Like, look at Australia and the heat waves they've had and, and the massive numbers of animals that have just dropped dead because of the heat. Right. And by the way, several people have passed away from that as well. So, I mean, that's pretty drastic when over uh, like hundreds of thousands, like multiple hundreds of thousands of cows died yeah. Yeah. during, I, a, a, I think there was a drought and then there was a flood. And, and then all the bats, there was a, a major extinction event with the, the Murray carp that, that was already endangered. Uh, and just thing after thing. And, and the thing is, the news isn't reporting all these things that are happening all over. So when they're saying it's a global thing, but they're not reporting on all these global events, then of course people will think, well, it's only happening here, you know, when it's happening to them. Right. But if you hear it all over, I mean, that's one of the reasons I'm on here is because you're not hearing these things. You're not hearing about the 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 oh, the starfish that's dying, the sea star, um, the sunflower sea star that's that's dying in off the west coast that um, preyed on the sea urchins, and the sea urchins ate down the entire kelp forest because because the sunflower sea star, star had a a disease and and died like something similar to mad cow disease i think or um it, it's just a horrible disease where their body just starts falling apart and the tricky, the tricky thing is unless you've had i mean unless you've had personal experience with the species um it's challenging to to work up the the compassion uh, because there's so much suffering in the world and there's so many species that are suffering, right? And the, the species that, you know, that we end up 
affect us the most are, or that affect, you know, draw our compassion out the most would be the ones that affect us most immediately in our immediate environment. But the, um, the impact of um, climate change on any, you know, particular location or any particular species, the connection is always ambiguous, right? You can't, you can't draw a direct connection usually between any, any weather event, any specific weather event or any specific um, death of a species and climate change. It's a pattern, right? It's, it's, it's not the loss of the starfish or this, it's, it's all because it's all happening so much of it. Right. And that's the connection because it's the, the frequency has increased right. so rapidly. And so in such, uh, to such a degree that that's where you draw the connection to, to climate change. But on a local level, um, I mean, the, the challenge I think is to, how do we localize that? How do we this bring it home for it's people? All, because it's all happening. So oh, much sorry, my phone is. That's all right. I'm trying to read the chat and my phone started playing it. Sorry. Yeah, I know. I, it just frustrates me that the media won't have breaking news every time there is a massive event like that. It should be breaking news instead of yeah. a movie star doing this or that or whatever the, the, sports teams are doing you can tell i'm a real sportsy person and into the celebrity thing because i have no idea what's going on there but most people would rather watch that than than talk about what is happening with our planet our right. this is our our life this is where we live it's our home and and no one is i mean not, none of the big major media is talking about the stuff that should be breaking news every day the wells that are beaching. Uh, actually, there was actually a story about that. It blew me away this morning. There was a, a news story about a well that had like 40, um, 40 pounds awesome. of plastic in yeah. its stomach. So yeah, like here and there, they'll give these, uh, you know, stories, but they're so common that they should be on the news every single day. So it gets beat through people's heads what's actually happening and we have three minutes guys till we're going to start taking comments so get them ready um and questions please put a cue so i so i could prioritize questions um yeah sorry i, I have a very interactive audience that's great <laughs> that's great they are amazing I, I have the best people on my channel i swear i swear i do um yeah but my whole point is yeah they need a they need to definitely talk about it more in the news. And I just don't think they do. I think people have a better idea of what's going on. Well, but at the same time, the news has been commercialized is now. On, you know, oh yeah. The they're paid. They're, they're paid to keep quiet about certain things. And, and also there's the possibility that they're worried about mass panic and then hoarding of supplies. If people found out, um, I mean, nobody knows what's going to happen and when exactly, we, we just well, that, that's the whole thing is you know when people do start to realize um that there's environmental disaster coming the the, the response is usually to consume more mm -hmm. like people people eat more people buy more and um you know it's the exact opposite of the what well, what we need to be doing yeah we should be growing more Right. Like instead of right. growing a lawn, grow some vegetables on that, you know, grow some more of your own vegetables, grow some food on your patio. There's right now we have access to YouTube. So it's a great time to learn and right. teach your children how to do it as well. All these things that our grandparents or our great grandparents yeah. could do. And we have yeah. no idea. Right. Right. I mean, I was taught that. You know, but the new generation isn't taught how to grow. I mean, not everybody, a few people, but not very many. And that's what we should be doing. I mean, wouldn't you feel better if you had some vegetables growing out, you know, out your door that you can go pick in case of a food shortage? Have you seen the articles about the, uh, the there's a few people that are like fighting their these, these restrictions on use of their lawn. They want to let their lawn grow wild. Oh right? yeah. Yeah. Uh, I had and, someone and, on talking about that last week. Yeah, that's fascinating. Yeah. And then, and then some places you can't collect rainwater. It's yeah. Th that's happened here. Like, yeah. Wow. wow. It's, amazing. it's insane. I mean, but they don't want, they want you to buy the Nestle bottled right. water. In a bottle. <laughs> remember how ridiculous that was when we were kids. We're like, yes, we drink water. out of a hose. What? 
Oh I my. drink out of a hose. All oh, right. I and now people are lighting their hoses on fire. You know, like I they're... know. <laughs> this is terribly <laughs> sad. To me. Yeah. And Utah is like lives. the fracking like center of the world right now. I mean, they want it to be. They're opening right. up so many leases to fracking here. It's insane. It's disgusting. And yeah. Oh my gosh. Okay. It's six. Okay, I will turn my sound down. Okay, guys, tell me how that is. Is my sound better? I turned it down. Is it better? How's mine? Better. Great. Okay, do they match now, guys? Do our voices match? Okay. Test, test. Okay. <laughs> okay, cool. All right. We are going to go to comments now and questions. So, we have I wish I could pronounce that name. Bjarn Kola. I don't know. I probably totally screwed that up. So I think it's Bjorn. Bjorn. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, John. What about the krill for the whales? Sad. Yeah. Well, all the whales. Uh, yeah. Like what they eat is is going away. They're ingesting plastic, and that's just terrible. Um, Eshiva. Let's see. She's talking to Julie Love. We need to replace meat for people who whine about having to be vegetarian. A significant percentage of our food crops are eaten up by the meat that's grown and slaughtered for humans. Sad, but kind of true. Um, <laughs> but Kermit, that's not funny. Krill the wells. It, I mean, it kind of is. But <laughs> I'd rather krill them than kill them. So. <laughs> You know, it's interesting. We've got all this compassion for large mammals, you know, and, you know, people get upset about giraffes and lions and understandably, but you know, the, what's really concerning me now are, is the, the reports on insect decline. Oh yes. Nobody likes insects. I absolutely hate mosquitoes, like with an irrational passion, but, yeah. but, you know, losing and that, you know, some places they're reporting between 50 and 80 percent loss of insects i mean we're talking about the whole food chain being wiped out if you can't take out the bottom of it or you know i guess microbes are the bottom of it but you can't take out a whole layer of it and then not have everything just collapse mm, what about the plankton that absorbs all the carbon? And exactly yeah and, things and like the plank that. that's what made me think about it was the plankton we mm -hmm. we get a lot of compassion for whales but not a lot for plankton but the well, whales can't what are the whales going to eat I you know, know. It's all the web of life. I mean, it's all important. We need to reserve some, you know, all, I, I don't know. We just don't pay enough attention to anything. Sure, the cuddly koala bears people will talk about, but but not the, you know, the, the things that aren't as pretty and fun, Sorry. you Sorry. know, are cute. Okay, stop. I'm not trying to block anyone. Dang it. Okay. Uh, let's see. I know I saw a comment from going south. Um, hi, Torstein. What happened after what storm? Okay. Um, oh, there it is. I saw tons of, of kelp in the fjord today. Um, happened after the storm. So I guess they had, I think he's up in Greenland, Torstein. Um, I don't know, okay. you're gonna have to correct me, but yeah. Um, Let's see. I like the cute airplane and the gods must be crazy. I love that movie. That movie was insane. <laughs> Have you ever seen that movie? The gods must be crazy. Yep. Yep. It's, it's a really, really good movie as far as, you know, showing how you, one little action can affect so many. Oh, right. Right. That, that's the point I got out of that movie. So let's see. Not getting a lot of comments. I hope my comments, my chat didn't go dead again. Am I missing comments, Oz? He's from my, um, he's from very close to me, uh, just about an hour and a half away from where I'm at. Yeah, he's very exciting. And, and, you know, I just saw an interview um, uh, where he was being asked about his 
you know, about religion. And it was, it was refreshing to hear uh, him defend, to hear a liberal, you know, defending his, not belief, but def- saying religion and isn't something that is a, uh, that, that the conservatives have a, you know, monopoly on and like, like patriotism. And it's frustrating to see, um, uh, you know, like I've got liberal or leftist friends who, who, yeah, it's Pete Buttigieg that we're talking about. I'm sorry. Yeah. And, um, uh, you know, it's frustrating for me to, uh, to hear some of my leftist, leftist friends, you know, poo poo patriotism or, or, or religion. When I really think that these things have, you know, I realize there's problems with both of them, but they have power and in people's minds over people's minds. And when we just refuse to engage in that discourse, we lose an opportunity to engage people's minds. And, um, and religion is uh, religion. The interaction between uh, the intersection between religion and spirituality is something that concerns me a lot. And uh, in fact, the the author of um, "Don't Even Think About It," the book I was just talking about, he talks about how um, you know he suggests that we re-engage uh, religious discourse as a way of you know getting people um, to accept and uh, make necessary changes in response to climate change. And when we, you know when we just throw religion out or we throw the flag out, uh, then we're just leaving it to conservatives uh to to dominate that discourse and they say well you know there's no there's no one party that owns religion or god or the flag uh, and unfortunately it often seems like that's the case so it's it's uh, that's one one reason i like to hear well uh, i like to listen to buddha gig is um he's religious openly religious and he doesn't apologize for it okay that's awesome. Okay, so apparently, um, John, your your microphone is a little too loud now because they're oh. breathing. <laughs> so, sorry, <laughs> that's part of the problems with the headsets, man. They're they're terrible that way. All right, hopefully that's uh, better. Sorry, hopefully. Should have um, done a mic check. Yeah, we, well, we were hoping to before, but we got kind of pressed on time. Um, yeah, so next time we'll remember to do that. Um, let's see. Z- uh, wait, I'm trying to find the, I, I'm sorry, I lost comments for like 15 minutes and now I just got them back. So I have a ton here. So I'm just going to start at the bottom. How, how do you say that name again, John? Bar, Bar, Buddha gig. No, Barjnit, Barjnicola, Bar. Oh, Bar- Bjorn. Bjorn. Yes. Yeah. That, <laughs> that just, this is a click. I, I'm guessing, but I mean, that's, that's how I understand you say that okay yeah more wasps too why are they immune yeah the wasps are are pretty bad and especially after it's wet and then it gets hot again wasps are super bad um but they there are certain species that will actually flourish for a while before their decline uh, oh yeah of their predators die off or something and it's just the way it goes they'll they'll for a minute flourish and and then they'll and then they'll decline so it's that's just the way it's going right now certain ones are just gone and other ones flourish for a while um i'm repeating myself so i best stop let's see gore had current chan i don't know whatever happened to that chris i don't know i don't know jilly um let's see Ashiva, the hotter the oceans get the longer the waves get till the oceans become still enough to stop weather and finally freeze everything back again let's dump a world of salt on the salt brine pools and i'm not sure what he's talking about <laughs> or i don't know if Ashiva is a, a male or female so he or she is talking about i don't know do you know what he's saying? What what that is about? No, you, no, I don't think we're going to freeze at this point. Um, well, the, I mean, we're going to have worse blizzards in some cases. I yeah, mean, some places will. Yeah. We. Um, yeah. So. Uh, some some scientists have said we should talk about climate weirding. 
Yeah, because, yeah. Right. Uh, Paul Beckwith, I follow yeah. him, and he talks about climate weirding. But overall, the planet is getting warmer. Right. And and so of course there's gonna like we're in the second driest state in the country, and we're getting a lot of water, a lot. We're we were in a drought for several years. Now we're we're at, I mean, some places here almost two hundred percent of of the water, you know, the precipitation already. Right. So, you know, it's going to be weirding for sure. I, I can tell you that much. Uh, human audio check is the only thing that matters. Everything else is extra. <laughs> sorry, human. I'm sorry. Okay, where is it? Chris Boss. It's, oh, there it is. Yeah, sure, make me read it on that. It's so tiny. Would it be feasible for the environmental charities to pool the resources to help fund an MSM channel to get the truth out to the population? Chris Foster, yeah. <laughs> you know, um, a, lot, a lot of the di discussion around climate change seems to be focused on defeating denialists, right, and, and, and getting information out. And I, I think that's important, and and certainly um, it's it's essential. But I do think I'm a str I'm a strong believer that human beings are not <clears throat> solely or even primarily rational beings, and we can flood people with information, but it won't necessarily lead to correct opinions, or or even more importantly, won't lead to healthy, productive action. And for that, I feel like we need to engage um, the right brain more, or if you know, that's a, more of a metaphor than reality, but um, engage the part of our, the emotional brain, uh, engage our emotions more and, and speak the language of, and this is something I talk about in the article, is speak the language of, of religion, of myth, of storytelling, of um, art, and um, this, the science is very important and, and it's essential, but it's not going to sway the majority of people, I don't think. And we need to have a, we need to have a better story. We need to have a better um, way of not just telling the facts or, or telling the truth, but making it meaningful to people and helping people understand their place in a larger narrative and that's what one thing that religion when it when religion's doing what it does well um it does at its best religion does that well yeah and if they were worshiping the planet instead of a, a god in true. man image i i I'd, I'd settle i honestly at this point i would settle for them worshiping the man in the sky so long as the man in the sky would tell them to take care of the earth yeah. i mean you know um but that's that doesn't seem to be happening so <sighs> okay zen doesn't think that we're talking enough about solutions apparently i mean i thought that's what we were talking about but i don't know <laughs> i mean honestly at this point uh i think things are bad enough that um you know i i think the extinction of the human species is i don't think it's going to be near term i don't think it's going to be my lifetime but i do think it's a foregone conclusion and um, so for me, and this is what I talk about in the article and I really didn't get to this, but the critical question for us as a species now, I think is accepting that we are doomed in a way, no, really that we are doomed and deciding how we're going to live in light of that truth. What, what different what different choices would we make as individuals for example if we had just received a terminal diagnosis right and then what choices would we as a species or as a civilization make differently if we realized that in the next 100 or 200 years or maybe less uh our civilization or our species will be gone you know how will we live differently on this planet uh it, realizing that and i think it's ironic but that the the choices that we need to make i don't think we can actually make them as a group until we accept that we are doomed and that we mm. we give up this 
struggle to survive or struggle to project our our you know our, ourselves on into the future and to you know live live for forever through our creations until we give up in a way that I, the idea that we can save ourselves or save civilization or save our or, or save the planet um because that's amazing hubris to think that human beings can yeah. can do that right but we can save what's there right we can now. save parts of it right we there are parts of it that we can save we have to we, kill it off faster this the part the parts <laughs> that's what that, I would say if you want to talk about solutions, you need to walk out your door and look around you and find the parts of the natural world that you are precious to you and figure out what you need to do to preserve those. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that's the most important thing yeah, we can do in terms of saving something. Yeah, that's what I'm, yeah. Uh, I'm definitely, definitely want to save more of the wild natural world. Um, Oswald Spangler is John familiar with the dark mountain project founded by Paul Kingsworth and Dougald, Doug, Hi. Uh, Dougald yeah. Hine. Yeah. <laughs> I have no idea what that is. Yeah. They've been a big uh, inspiration for me. They, they've also kind of come to the conclusion that civilization is doomed. And what they're trying to do is create art and storytelling that will um, um, kind of express that and but also point away into a, a different kind of future I guess um, and not not in the hopes of saving anything necessarily but but finding art that's appropriate for this final phase of human civilization and um, yeah, they're, they're a big inspiration. Uh, um, Paul Kingsnorth is somebody that I quote in the article as well. So and I, he's, he's, um, he's been a big inspiration for me. Okay. As Shiva scientists said, we have 12 years to stop greenhouse gas emissions or the weather will soon get caught up in a feedback loop that doesn't stop until the temp reaches over 800 degrees Fahrenheit. And, and I've heard like recently that we're already locked into um, four to possibly 18 degrees temperature rise. Well, I haven't heard those numbers. I've heard uh, like five at the upper end, but I and locked in probably at two. But um, the thing is we've known about climate change since 1993, right? It's mm -hmm. been 25, is that 25 years? Uh, no. I can't do the math here. <laughs> We've known it for um, a long time. Yeah, 25 years, 25 years. Well, longer than that. There's scientists that talk Well, about sure. But I mean, uh, you know, I, but 1993 is when James Hansen testified in front of Congress, right? Yeah. Like that should have been the wake up to the whole world. Yeah. And during, in that time period, we've actually dramatically increased um, emissions. So much so that we have produced more emissions between 1993 and now than we as a human civilization produced in the previous 10,000 years. So we, you know, I don't see anything changing in 12 years. You know, not, if, if, not, if that's been the past 25 years, and what's really going to turn things around uh, now? You know, I, I, I don't... I, that 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 uh, report came out about a month or two after I published these articles, and they just confirmed everything I had said and written. That just that's that's it. I mean, that's there's no way we we're, we're going to um, be able to pull that off a 45 percent reduction in 12 years. Oh, that's no way. No, there's way. no way. So Gazar Gazar said, Mother Nature will sort it out be fine and dandy <laughs> i i definitely agree with that um my personal belief is we're we're gonna face a, a severe food shortage short, shortage god i can't even talk it's been long day. um before that and and water supply issues clean water um you don't see that as being a problem with our increased population that just is not slowing down oh absolutely um but what i'm gonna what when we talk about population, you've got to remember that in the, you know, the population growth is in primarily in third world countries, but it's the first world countries that are having fewer children, but are consuming 
more uh, yeah, than the third world countries, right? They have a greater footprint, but now some of those other countries are starting to build their economies and and try and, and building their footprint. In the meantime, um, they said if if we had the um, the okay, in order to to be sustainable at Japan's like level of of standard of living, their footprint, we'd have to have two planets. So and and more and than our, that, and ours is like six or seven in the yeah, US. It's, right? it's just ridiculous. Yeah. So people are trying to emulate our standard of living. So it's completely unsustainable. And we are over time already. Can you believe that? It goes so fast. Our yeah, it does. so freaking fast. It's ridiculous. Um, so I will probably have you on again if you have any Absolutely. stories or whatever. I would love it. Just shoot me an email. Um, okay. I'm gonna say hi to everybody's here if there's any last minute comments. Um, so yeah, Torstein, thanks you for coming. Um, I don't know what they're talking about, so I'll just I'm just saying hi. Hi Zen, how are you? He was one of my guests last week. Um Ken Deal, thank you for coming. He says collapse will take the emissions down fast. Um, probably too fast. Then you have the aerosol thing. Uh, yeah, going to that right. one. <laughs> <laughs> going south, the big illusion from IPCC is the tipping point is ahead of us. Yeah, it's already behind us. That was that was Torstein. Um, Zar Gazar, too late humans. Um, I know there's some people who 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 are pretty big doomers on here and i kind of am too so um yeah you <laughs> i will definitely attract them i guess um okay julie julie loves asks is, is john an incrementalist and a poo pooer i don't think you're you what are you? <laughs> is, it, is an incrementalist somebody who thinks that uh, the that's collapse like a Nancy is Pelosi or down the road? Is yeah, that what that I don't know if, the, if she means that. I know you're not a poop pooer because you believe it. <laughs> um, I think a lot of people are worried that if people keep saying that it's so far in the future and don't see it's already happening, that that there won't be any action. You know, because it is happening now. It's in front of our face. Yes, it is. So saying that it won't happen till you know. Like well, what I'm talking about, what I'm talking about is Mad Max. I mean, I, I know there's some people who think we're ten years away from Mad Max. Okay. And I don't, I don't see that. Um, I, I don't, I don't see that at all. So I mean, I just, I just don't think that's reality. It's a freaking movie for Christ's sake. So <laughs> <laughs> I don't. Well, it, it, you know, it could be reality uh, that just a little further down the road, and, um, but. Um, yeah, and, and I, I I don't think the timing matters so much. I, I, I what bothers me is like if it if it doesn't happen in your lifetime, it it doesn't worry you. I, I mean, yeah. Where does? Well, yeah. but it should still worry you. I have kids, right? And so do you, and our right? Grandkids, and how about yeah. humanity? I mean, do, yeah. do, what about be... the rest of? Who, I'm sorry, screw humanity. What about all the animals? Yeah, what I mean, about the other life? This is billions of years of evolution has gone into our current, you know, what we have here on this planet, not just humans, but all the species, and we're just wiping it out in 150 years. It's, it's incredible. Yeah, it is. It's, it is insane. So, you know, I, I don't know where to go from here. I, all I want to do is try and make the, try to save what I can. I mean, try to fight to save what I can, try to get people to fight what, for what they can, what's left and not freaking build more stuff that's right. going to just extract more resources to build this stuff that's supposed to be saving us. Meanwhile, we're, we're killing the rest of the, the planet, that's what little we have left. So that's my frustration. The Green New Deal will be a disaster. It won't help anything. It just won't. It's not going to help anything. Um, after all the research I've done, just the manufacturing of what you would need to, to go there, it, it, that energy use alone would take so many resources. Well, and, it's, and it's only dealing with the demands, uh, with the supply side of things. It doesn't deal with reducing any kind of consumption. And mm -hmm. the, the fact is windmills and, and solar and all that, it's great, but it will never produce the level of energy that 
uh, that would support our keep, lifestyle that we live that now. Our, exactly. Yes. And that's what people want. They want to survive and live that's the right. same lifestyle that we have right now. And that's, that's totally. Right. And that's what sustainability has come to mean, right? Sustain my current lifestyle. No, right? let, it's sustainability. And I, since I just talked to Derek, this is a huge thing. Yeah, I know it, it is. Sh- <laughs> it should mean sustaining the na- natural the world. Right. Not yeah. sustaining humans in their consumer lifestyles and and ah and the capitalism and all that not sustaining that but sustaining the natural world as much as possible that's what environmentalists used to do and now they don't do that anymore right so, yeah sorry you, you got me right after i got all revved <laughs> up with, with derek i'm very sorry about that <laughs> It's easy to get revved up with him. Yeah. Yeah, it definitely is. And I can't, okay, I can't see the chat, but yeah, we are so over. I'm sorry, guys. Um, leave messages in the comments. Um, wait, I'll get bio really quick because I haven't read a bio comment. It's not like you must have kids. Yeah, you don't have to kiss. Remember, plenty of men are choosing, are chosen away from reproduction. What should they do? Rape and force women. You guys make it sound like people just have to do it. What? No, you don't have to have children. In fact, I would recommend you don't. Yes, I have children. um, But I would not bring, if I I were in that stage of having kids, I would not bring kids into this world right now. I wouldn't. Just knowing the suffering that's going to go on. And yeah, and I actually didn't want to have kids at all. The doctors wouldn't fix it. If we could just limit unwanted pregnancies on this planet, we would go a long ways. Oh yeah. Um, I shouldn't say unwanted, unintended. I love my kids, but all of my pregnancies were unintended. And I asked to have my tubes tied and my doctor refused to do it. He said, have your husband get a vasectomy. My husband at the time would not get a vasectomy. So yeah. I have three kids. There you go. <laughs> Birth control didn't work. And also get rid so, of that that religious notion that uh, God makes babies, right? Not sex. Yeah, and, and right? have his, bring his, oh, they're all waiting up in heaven. They're all waiting up in heaven for righteous yeah. families to come to, right? Right. Yeah. God, I hate that. Uh, but forget about them once they're on the planet. We don't need to feed them. <laughs> that's, that's right. <laughs> You're <laughs> on your own, pick, kid. Pick yourself up by your bootstraps. <laughs> you got this. <laughs> my god uh all right guys really 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 we we are over by 12 minutes okay i love i love all you guys um uh okay okay trev b5 i i didn't say hi to you so i'm saying hi now trev b5 um jilly okay i hope i got everybody who's been commenting guys all right that's it. Thank you guys very much. Hold on just a second, John. And okay. everybody, uh, tomorrow I will be here with, with Sandy from Environmental Coffee House at 6 p.m. Um, we will be having some great conversations. She wants to talk about the Derek interview too. So there's going to be continuing discussion on that. And our discussion will be more open forum where it will bring you guys in. Um, before the last 15 minutes that we're on so um yeah you know you know how you know me and zandy so anyway guys y'all have a very good evening and we will see you tomorrow have a good night